Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Welcome to Speech in the Silence, the podcast that is all Thelema all the time. Visit us and listen to our complete archive of programming at speechinthesilence.com or contact us at thelemapodcast at gmail.com. Now ye shall know that the chosen priest and apostle of infinite space is the prince priest, the beast, and in his woman called the scarlet woman is all power given. They shall gather my children into their fold. They shall bring the glory of the stars into the hearts of men. For he is ever a sun, and she a moon. But to him is the winged secret flame, and to her the stooping starlight. What is the spirituality of OTO? We tend to think of this in somewhat vague terms. And so far as people contemplate it at all, they might think of OTO as a mere fraternity of individuals who are doing their will or who accept the book of the law. These are certainly unclear terms, or they're certainly terms that people have disagreeing interpretations on. The central public and private right of OTO, the Gnostic Mass, clearly expresses some kind of spiritual doctrines. And yet Crowley said comparatively little about the doctrines and how they're instantiated in the Mass. And with only a few exceptions, our bishops have been reticent and reluctant to fill in those blanks. I would like to try to fill in some of these blanks myself, based only upon my understanding of Thelema and my own experience in OTO. And so I would like to speak for a while and try to explicate the spiritual principles that I see manifest in the work of OTO. Before I begin, I must say a word about what I count to be a spiritual principle. I believe a spiritual principle is a principle governing the universe which transcends me and which I am dependent upon. By transcending me, I mean that it is not me. Not in the sense that I, that I normally take myself as, as a separate individual from other individuals walking about on the surface of the earth. In some sense, it is above me, we might say. By dependent, I mean that my having a meaningful life requires me to have some kind of connection to this principle. I emphasize a meaningful life. I'm not speaking here primarily of biological dependence. For example, I am dependent upon water to live, but I would not call water a spiritual principle. What I mean is something that, in the absence of it, I might continue as a biological creature, as a living creature, but my life would no longer be worth living. Even by whatever whatever definition of that I have. So because this thing which I am dependent upon is transcendent, it is suitable to have a kind of religious devotion toward that. And by religious, I don't really mean anything here other than that it's done with a certain level of seriousness. For example, you might say that someone watches Game of Thrones religiously. They're very serious about it. So I don't I don't necessarily mean to include any of the baggage of of organized religion in that. Only the idea of something which is worthy of, of serious respect because of the function that it plays in grounding something like a worthwhile life. Now in the context of Thelema, it's not really just one spiritual principle. I want, to, I want to show you that it's actually two principles that have to come together to 
provide meaning, to provide purpose, and that these two principles are operative in the core work of OTO. The first of these principles is an ordering principle. It's a principle, the action of which causes things to become ordered, to become regular, to be less disordered, less chaotic. And lots of, lots of religions have, have principles or ideas like this or, or gods that represent them. This is not new in any way to Thelema. We find such a principle very often associated with language. Think of the tree of life or, or find a picture of, of the tree of life and look at its, its geometric structure, its symmetry, the immediate sense of hierarchy one gets from looking at it. And now notice that every one of the paths on the tree of life, those connecting lines between the Sephiroth, each one of them has a letter of the Hebrew alphabet on it. The structure of the Kabbalistic universe or, or the magical universe is a structure which is provided by or has some kind of necessary dependence upon language. Notice that language is present on the entire tree of life, on all the paths going all the way up to Kether at the top. Language is not just part of the Ruach. Language is not just the discursive understanding, as we might call it. Language is part of the entire tree, even above the abyss. We might also note that the word of a magus is associated with the sphere of chokmah, which is above the abyss. The word of a magus orders an entire historical epoch. It defines the horizon of spirituality within a certain historical time frame. And it is definitely an above-the-abyss phenomenon. Likewise, it makes sense to associate the true will of each person with the part of the soul which is associated with Hokma, which is called Hia. The will is not inchoate. It's not purely biological. It's that, that, that's, that's, that's what's called the animal soul or the nefesh, which tends to be a lower part of the soul. The, the will is associated with a higher part of the soul, and it's intelligible. In fact, it is the job of the ruach to, as Crowley says, form an image or a representation of what the will is, as passed down from Hia in the supernal triad of each person's soul. That would be impossible if the will were not in some sense intelligible. In other words, it has to show up as something for a mind in order to understand it. In the context of Thelema, it is the, the will which provides the order and the structure to a life. It does this by providing its, its purpose, its ultimate aim. It 
You can think of the will as functioning in a life in a way that's similar to a pillar, central support of a building. Or a tent pole. It's similar to how a, a village might have, or a town might have, a, a, a structure in the middle around which everything else revolves. Some, some cosmological or cosmic symbols of the same thing are, are the world tree, which is mentioned in the Mass. The axis mundi, the phallus, all of these things are, are straight lines. And the straight line is a, is a symbol of chokmah. You could think of one's life as being straight. You're following sort of the, the straight and narrow, if you will, if you're following your will, if you're keeping to that. The will is what is responsible for providing the backbone for your entire existence. The symbol of the straight line shows up in the Gnostic Mass. The priest walks around carrying, carrying a stick, carrying a straight line in the form of the lance. priest takes up the work of chaos, who is mentioned in the, in the creed of the Mass as, as the primary masculine symbol or primary masculine force in the cosmos. In that first clause of the creed, we see chaos also associated with the sun. This isn't the sun considered as you know, a, a ball of plasma in space. It's not, it's not primarily as a physical object that we're thinking about the sun here, but more like a transcendent ordering principle. The sun literally transcends the earth by being, in a sense, a, above our heads. <laughs> In Crowley's analogous analysis of the Magus card in the Book of Thoth, he associates the true will with, with Logos. And he is careful here to associate Logos. Logos just means speech. But he specifically, he specifically references the Gospel of John, which begins... In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. It's primarily by a kind of speech that God orders the universe. Creates something like, like a habitable, meaningful existence out of it. The Hebrew letter associated with the Magus card is bet, house, an abode. A house isn't just some spot on the surface of the earth that you happen to live in. It's a home. We talk about feeling at home in the world, or, or feeling not at home, at, not at ease like we don't belong. One of the effects of this ordering function, and, and, and the Logos exists in each person, too. Keep that in mind. So the Word is made flesh in Christianity, but each, each of us, the, the Word is flesh in each of us. And insofar as we, we utilize that, that divine speech, we are able to be at home in the world. 
Existence is not alien to us. We're not just staring at things. Things don't just happen to us. We're involved in, in a project of living, of pursuing aims, of, of having a meaningful life. So the first principle is order or will or, or logos. They all mean roughly the same thing. The second principle is, is represented in the creed and in other places by, by Babylon. In the second article of the creed, we, we find that Babylon is associated with earth and womb. Crowley associates her with matter. But this isn't, this isn't just inert or formless matter. That's, that's, not, that's not the proper way to think about it. It's matter in the sense that every time we experience, we experience something. There is no such thing as, a, as just a pure consciousness. Not, not in the context of a, of a life. Of course not. We're always experiencing something. That something, no matter what it is, is in a certain sense Babylon or, or an aspect of Babylon. The, the wildness and the ferocity and, and the unpredictability, but also the, the nurturing and the, and the caring aspects of mother that are all tied up in Babylon are really just features of, of life itself. I don't mean life here necessarily in the sense of a, a biological being, although, of course, it means that. I mean life more in the sense of what you mean when you say to someone, hey, you need to get a life. Like, you need to get out more. <laughs> you need to try some new things. Get some interests, right? Right? which means that it's possible to kind of cut off life in various ways. You can do this by, by not trying. You could do this by just trying to smother uh, or destroy any sense of spontaneity in existence through an excess of order. There are a lot of ways to do it. But that aspect of experience which is given, which we don't have control over, which shows up and which we are in a certain sense subject to, that's what I'm calling the principle of life itself, principle of spontaneity, as represented by Babylon. Sometimes we think of Babylon as being, you know, this sort of remote attainment, master of the temple. Something that only a few individuals will ever have any kind of access to or understanding of. Other times we think of Babylon as a particular deity, as a personality, let's say that we can do rituals to. There's nothing illegitimate about looking at Babylon that way. That's fine. But I'm suggesting that there is a more concrete, more accessible way of, of, of thinking about this and how this operates in our lives. We might think instead of just we might think of reality before or somehow transcending our preconceptions. Something which was there before we showed up, before we start, and which we are dependent upon. And therefore something which is also worthy of our devotion. Even though it is, strictly speaking, 
completely beyond good and evil. It cannot be tamed. The world is as wide and indomitable as Babylon herself. It is Pan. Now, our lives are determined in large part by how we respond to our experiences. And if I'm right, then those experiences are largely constituted by Babylon or the principle she represents. Life calls for some response. If you just sit still and just try to do nothing, just try to phone it in, nature will eventually just destroy you and make some new things out of you. It'll be completely impassive in its approach. So you have to move, you have to do something, you have to respond. But how? What I would like to suggest is that we should respond by living in accordance with a transcendent principle. And in Thelema, that principle is called true will, which we have seen that Crowley identifies with Logos. This is, not, this is not a purely remote principle. Of course, Logos structures the cosmos. We look around into the universe and we see, we see order. But this, this principle also operates in each one of our lives and makes us who we are. You can think of the true will of an individual as the particular way in which that cosmological principle manifests in the context of, let's say, a particular nervous system. We have a tendency to get hung up on which aim we should choose. Whether this thing or that thing is my true will. But the particulars probably matter a lot less than simply choosing anything at all. Experience is always enticing us towards something. Things are constantly flashing at us in various ways. We feel drawn toward, toward people, toward activities, toward things. Things which might, might prompt growth, prompt development. This is why it is said that in beauty is eternal truth revealed. But as soon as we, we pursue one of these glittering gems, life immediately responds. And I'm sorry, but it's quite rare for life to respond in, by getting behind us with all of its force, as Crowley says in Magic and Theory and Practice. Just as often, we immediately face challenges and difficulties, even calamities. Events which will turn the, the faint of heart back into the safety and comfort of the order which they already know. Into their own small sense of world and of self. And 
No sooner do we set off for the city of the sun than we are waylaid by bandits. Everything depends upon how one responds. If one refuses to retreat, but insists upon pushing forward, the trick then becomes maintaining one's own personal integrity in the face of external pressure, in the face of challenge. This means keeping the original end in sight, but more importantly than that, it means making sure our words align with our thoughts and our actions align with both. Form a straight line through all of them. In this way, we are true to ourselves. By doing so, we declare for ourselves the goodness of life even in the face of catastrophe. We do not succumb to tragedy, but transcend it. And maybe we have to, you know, recalibrate or readjust our aim or adjust our expectations, and that's fine. It's okay to do that. You don't have to be, you don't have to be right at the outset. In fact, it's your odds of being right at the outset are practically zero. But that's okay. You just have to keep aiming and keep trying. But you have to maintain integrity. If you are able to maintain that internal integrity... That, that straight line as represented as symbolizing chokmah and the true will, then you are internally providing the structure and the stability which will allow life, the power of life, to transform you, to reshape you, to transform you into a new being, into a better being, one with a clearer sense of what they are capable of, and a bigger sense of the world, and a bigger sense of self. And with real power and real self-respect, Probably the respect of others, too. Life will not show up as a destructive force, although it will still be dangerous. Life is always dangerous. But we can, we can take that power of, of destruction, that power, and, and pull it inwards and utilize it for transformation and to invigorate us. We can take death upon ourselves and turn death into transformation. Mastery over life and death, this is, this is the harmonization, this is the bringing together of those two principles of the true will or chaos on the one hand and life or Babylon on the other. Now these two principles are united in the deity of Rahorkuit. 
Rahor Kuwait is both solar and martial. The solar part is, is the beast or the lion serpent. The martial part corresponds with the scarlet woman. As scarlet is the king scale of Mars or the queen scale of Geburah. It's the union of the five and the six. Five is Geburah, six is Tefereth. Together they make 11. Union of microcosm and macrocosm, the number of magic. In other words, magic in general, magic, the art of life itself, is principally about these two principles, logos and life, and how they, they fit together in a particular existence. It's not about the dominance of one over the other. It's not about, you know, it's not about being so free of a spirit that you're not able to, to you know, build anything or to have any kind of, you know, aim in life. But it's not about having so much order that, you know, you can't let in spontaneity. It's, it's about the harmonization of the two. Harmonizing them in such a way that life can be experienced as meaningful. And so the question of spirituality and OTO is really about how we relate ourselves to this principle or to this dual principle, let's say, in and through the work of OTO. Or to put it another way, how, how are these principles embodied in our core practices? Well, one way that they're embodied is in the ethics of our degrees, particularly in the man of earth degrees. The purpose of those degrees is to help you to become a contributing member to OTO. So, so one of our purposes as an organization is to establish something like an ideal of Thalamic fraternity or Thalamic society. That doesn't work if everyone has a different idea of what Thalamic means. It, it just doesn't. There has to be something at the center. Otherwise, it just flies apart in every which way. And so we have a series of degrees which is meant to well, it's meant to initiate you into what those values are. Of course it probably doesn't come as any surprise that a, a large part of that is helping you to do your will. That, that's the logos half of the equation that I've been talking about. You have to know how to aim at your will, but that, that has we've already looked at two senses in which you aim at your will. There's, there's the idea of an external object, but what I've been trying to suggest is that that's not it's not really the most important aspect of it. What's more important is the internal alignment. So we don't really care what your true will is. It doesn't actually matter. Everybody can have their own true will. OTO, the work of OTO is more concerned with what are the conditions that have to be in place for every person, or for any person, let's say, if they want to aim. And we might think of those, those conditions as cognitive, emotional, and social. Cognitive is just that you have to have an idea of, of like what, what, what could count as a true will. 
you know, simply doing something because your boyfriend or girlfriend does it is not, it's, it's not going to, it's not going to be good enough. But you also have to have the emotional maturity to pursue whatever that is in a disciplined fashion. I mean, what good is it to know what your true will is if you can just be knocked off course by, you know, the first thing that happens to you as soon as you walk out of the temple? That's not, it's not going to do. You need to be able to avoid personal corruption. Individuals become corrupted very, very, very easily. Largely just by, by making exceptions for themselves all the time. And doing things which, even by their own standards, they know they shouldn't be doing. In fact, it's mainly by their own standards. That's what we're mostly concerned about. What good is it to be free of external standards, which is what we tout in, in Thelema, right? What good is that if you're not even going to follow your own standards then? So you have nothing. You can't live that way. And then you need something like a proper social structure to support that work. Which also means feeding into the social structure in a way which helps renew it rather than to corrupt it. Social structures have just as much of a propensity toward corruption as individuals, maybe, maybe more so. Since, since accountability can be diffused throughout an organization, and it's largely through lack of accountability that institutions become corrupt. Our institutions are like Osiris, the father. They represent a tradition that we come into. We represent the son. The son renews the father through well, through logos, through, through criticism, through critique. It's a really basic function of, of language. Through articulation, articulating our principles, understanding them. That's what, that's what breathes life back into old, decrepit, corrupt organizations. You know, if they're not completely beyond repair. And finally, it helps to understand the cosmological context in which something like aiming has any kind of meaning or intelligibility. So what are the, what are the ultimate aims of the universe? Or what's the ultimate purpose of life? And so you can make sense of some things now that, you know, the Crowley has said publicly about these degrees. For example, in What is Freemasonry, he says, I therefore answered the question, how should a young man mend his way? In a series of rituals in which the candidate is instructed in the value of discretion, loyalty, independence, truthfulness, courage, self-control, indifference to circumstance, impartiality, skepticism, and other virtues. There's not an emotional, va there's not a, a, an ethical vacuum at the center of this. There, there are actual values here. He also says the main objects of the instruction were two. He's talking about the, the man of earth degrees. It was first necessary to explain the universe and the relations of human life therewith. Second, to instruct every man how best to adapt his life to the cosmos and develop his faculties to the utmost advantage. So again, that's, 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 the, that's the cosmological context that the soul exists in. And, and the main actors in that cosmological picture are these two principles I've been talking about. The ordering principle, which we might call will or logos. And, and the living principle, the spon principle of spontaneity, which is symbolized by Babylon.
So the consciousness or the logos that I've been talking about is it's sometimes symbolized by the cross. Or sometimes it's it's a you know it's like a point that becomes a cube that unfolds into a cross. While the universe portion is symbolized usually by a circle. The project of these early degrees, and in all likelihood, it's the project, in all likelihood, the entire project can be thought of this way. But it's illustrating in various ways how the cross and the circle are to be joined, and how the joining of these two principles is what gives rise to, to a spiritual existence to a life of, of meaning and purpose. You can see these principles that I've been talking about also illustrated in the Gnostic Mass of that ritual. I mean, Crowley says, has said relatively little about this ritual, but he did say that he resolved that his ritual should celebrate the sublimity of the operation of universal forces without introducing disputable metaphysical theories. And people usually take these forces to be things like the sun, the air, earth, things like that. And that, that's not wrong. But it's, it's also, you also have to think about the God names by which these things are called. Yes, there are forces, but the intelligible parts of the forces, the aspects of those forces that we can understand, that we can relate to, that we can even manipulate with magic, those are the God names. Two of the most important God names for the Mass are yod heh vau or Tetragrammaton, and Ea-O, both of which involve the, the two principles under question. So after the consecration at the beginning, the, the priest is Yod, and the priestess is He of Tetragrammaton. He bears the weight of Logos, or, or in the language of the Mass, of, of Heaven, while she fulfills the function of life or of earth. He seats her upon the altar, which is a symbol of Bina. She takes up the place of Babylon, Speaking in the voice of Rahor Kuwait, who we have already seen is a, is a dual principle, she says, there is no law beyond do what thou wilt. Rahor Kuwait is the initiator. Life is always the initiator. Always. Consciousness cannot initiate itself. It doesn't work that way. Parting the veil, the priest adores her as Pan, as all. The elements of the Eucharist are serve the function as their children, so to speak. The host is Vau of Tetragrammaton, and the wine is He Final. The host is referred to as Life of the Sun. The wine is referred to as Joy of the Earth. It's Vau and He Final. They are married, so to speak, in Part 8 of the Mass, the title of which is The Mystic Marriage and Consummation, of the elements. So this is an example of hieros gamos, or sacred marriage. It's a particular aspect of the rose cross operation, which is the union of the circle and the cross at another level. The, the magical energy of this union, of this holy marriage, is drawn up into the priest when he consumes the Eucharist. 
can also look at this from the perspective of the formula of EIO. The broken particle off of the bread is yod, or I. It is, it is the sperm, or the seed, which is also the Word and the Holy Spirit. This is plunged into the cup, which we have already seen associated with earth and life itself. Together they form A, the babe in the egg, Harpocrates, pure potential. This expands into O, or Ayin, lord of the gates of matter, the devil, so to speak. Ayin represents the life of spirit in and through gross generation, which just means biological reproduction. Biological reproduction is the defeater of death. We are essentially celebrating the power of the word to take up the conditions of life and death and to transform them into conditions of renewal, of, of resurrection, of continuing life and meaningful dwelling on the face of the earth. We, all of us, are dependent upon this power in a very concrete sense. We were all born of a mother and of a father. I mean, whether, whether you identify with any you know, party in the mass or anything done, you were definitely born of a mother and father. That's how you got here. You know, we're creating conditions here and now, hopefully, for a better future for the next generation. That's a source of meaning. If you don't care about yourself and your own existence, which, which you should, but if you don't, you could at least do something for somebody else. And that will give you a sense of purpose and a sense of meaning. People who have children often say that their deaths, their own death, means less to them than the death of someone else. A parent will care about their own death insofar as they might worry who will take care of their child. But they care more about, about the child's death than their own. In general, taking responsibility makes us worry less about our own freedom from limitation. Other instances of the operation of this dual principle can probably also be found in other aspects of OTO. Understanding these ideas and articulating them to ourselves and to others makes us realize that this is not just some club for people to meet like-minded libertarians or libertines. It's not even primarily to meet other occultists, although it can serve these functions too. It makes us realize that we're in service to a higher principle. And that principle is not abstract. It's in everything we do. It's the reason we do any of it. And so by having, having consciousness of this purpose, 
and living in service and in devotion to it helps us approach our work with the seriousness demanded of religion. Love is the law. Love under will. This has been a production of Speech in the Silence. Thanks for listening. Visit us at speechinthesilence.com or write us an email at thelimapodcast at gmail.com. Love is the law. Love under will.